Well, hi everybody. Thank you very much for joining our ClearShare webinar. So we do a series of webinars um, around various topics. Um, so thank you very much for coming to this one. So my name is Opai Taiwo, for those of you that do not know me. I'm Partnerships Manager here at ClearSight. Um, and in terms of our topic today, we will be talking about the survival of the fittest. So um, a lot of the conversation is going to be around top traits of organizations that survive crisis. So the idea is that hopefully at the end of this webinar, you take a couple of insights, hopefully, that you can apply within your own organizations. Um, in terms of how this is going to work, so um, the speakers are going to have the conversation with us and just provide some insights. Um, and then we will have questions right at the end. So throughout this session, if you have any questions whatsoever, please put them in the question, the Q&A box, and I'll make sure I take note of this and um, present those to the speakers at the end of the session. So um, without further ado, I introduce you to our two amazing speakers today, um, Pete and Julie. Um, they'll be introducing themselves, um, but also yourselves, if you'd like to introduce yourselves, please put that in the chat box as well. Great, thanks so much, Ope. So, um, yeah, so you kick off the introductions. Uh, my name is Pete, I work for ClearSight. I spend most of my time uh, trying to work with uh, customers to understand how they use our technology, which is um, a employee listening and survey technology. Um, so we're really focused on trying to find the value in the voices uh, that we record in our surveys and raising them up so that leaders understand uh, the biggest issues uh, that people face and to provide a data-driven approach. And today I'll be talking about some of the research that we've gathered from about 2,000 organizations pre-crisis and about the 40 organizations that we've been working with uh, during the crisis uh, to try and bring out some insights that we can share with you today. Uh, Julie, I, I thought maybe you could introduce how you can. Yeah, sure. So OCAM is a, is a small boutique firm of business psychologists. We're really um, in existence to help organisations maximise the effectiveness of their individuals, their teams and their organisations. So what we do is take our understanding of the way that people work and the way that teams interact with each other um, and use the insights from tools such as ClearSight's uh, organisation fitness to help us direct um, the clients towards areas that they need to be addressing and so I'll be talking later on about how you can take those insights and do something with them to develop um, interventions that are going to help you make and implement sustainable change. Brilliant okay yeah so I mean that's actually a great uh, way to just introduce topics for today so what did we know about uh, from past crises um, and what can we learn um, yeah, the title itself sounds a bit Darwinian, Survival of the Fittest, but I think there's something we can take from that. Um, how prepared were organisations going into it? Uh, and what's changed? And then uh, Julie will then turn that into, I think, a really good description of some initiatives that we can consider or some of the big uh, challenges that she's been working on uh, with some leading organisations here in the UK. So um, what can we learn from the past crisis? I, th I think the first thing we can learn is that... Uh, uh, there's an old saying, never waste a good crisis. Uh, sometimes it can be a huge opportunity. And we've got three uh, incredibly well-known companies, all of which had uh, a different crisis to navigate. It's the 2009 economic crisis. Um, there's uh, a lot of companies that perhaps didn't survive that as well as they could have done. But Amazon actually took that crisis and turned it into an opportunity to expand their product line, diverse range of products and services uh, put online, moving from just a, a traditional seller of a small number of stockists to that long tail, which they're now famous for. Nike, uh, I think, has really benefited from making clear statements of purpose. Um, where we've seen in recent months, uh, organizations scrambling to take a response to Black Lives Matter, they were well ahead of the curve, identifying in Colin Kaepernick, uh, a role model who was, I think, saying things that many people in their society already felt, but weren't necessarily reflected in the brands that they bought. Um, that association, Colin Kaepernick and Nike, has been huge for them. Uh, generating 6 billion brand value and um, a quite tangible one third increase in sales. And of course, Netflix um, is something which I think many people use uh, significantly, but in 2000, they were still sending out DVDs through the post. 
uh, and they hadn't launched their online streaming service. Um, in fact, they were basically blockbuster with a mail order. Uh, and with that shift to online viewing, which is now something which is commonplace for all of us, especially uh, during this lockdown, Netflix took a really bold move to actually just make it a completely on-demand service and famously turned down that offer for Blockbuster to buy them. Um, and I think all of these companies just share a little bit of vision about how you can take something which could have been disastrous for them and take advantage of that big change in circumstance. So it's not always the case. You know, there are other organizations which haven't done so well, but what we've seen in there is uh, with Amazon, a really good focus on the customer. Uh, Nike, an amazing uh, idea to put their purpose and values front and center. And then also um, we've got, I think, uh, a great example of innovation there with Netflix. And so in our research, where we looked across 2000 organizations, ClearSight's been trying to decode uh, those examples, uh, not just for these big headline organizations, but for every organization in the UK to try to map what seems to be important when it comes to profitable, uh, profitability, growth, customer service or actually just good old-fashioned engagement and we distilled down uh, all of the information from those 2,000 organizations into these 16 areas. Uh, things that we know are the right things to do like having an inclusive organization in top left all the way down to things um, which oh sorry not just the right things to do but also an incredibly profitable uh, and good things to do from a financial performance point of view, uh, all the way down to something which I think is uh, always been on our, our agenda of a value driver, so uh, perceptions and strength of leadership. Uh, so we've organized these 16 uh, areas to try to create a framework where we can understand what seems to make the big difference. So what do those crises have in common? Uh, sorry, what do the organizations uh, that survive those crises have in common? they were fit organizations with clear strengths in this framework. Um, as I say, innovation, purpose and values, or just a really, really good sense of the customer. So how prepared, what was the picture in the UK prior to the crisis? Well, if we look across all of these different dimensions, um, we could see that uh, there were some areas which performed better than others. So we have already spoken about the linked purpose, actually less than half of the organizations we looked at had a strong purpose score. Similarly, most people in the UK uh, going into the crisis felt like they didn't have the tools to do the job uh, and that they weren't being heard properly. So only 48% of uh, people that we spoke to felt that they had been listened to. So again, across 2000 companies, uh, quite a good solid benchmark for us to be quite uh, strong about the conclusions. But people did feel that they were uh, collaborating well, that they were empowered to do their job, and indeed they were in the right job. So what we have is a sense of what was working well uh, and what could have been better. And I'd also point out that there's a huge difference between uh, the lowest 20% of scores, so the lowest 20% of the companies we looked at, versus the highest 20%. So the companies that are getting this really right are scoring on average about 91% across these 16 dimensions. Um, companies which are perhaps doing less well, uh, only about one in five of the, uh, the dimensions was a positive score. Uh, but on average, about 60% of this uh, is a positive result. Um, but what's really interesting for us is then linking these things to different outcomes. So in the middle of a crisis where everything has changed, we think customer connect connection is huge. So what did the companies that had the best customer service scores have in common? Firstly, as we discovered with Nike, they had a really clear purpose. So something which I think increasingly consumers or even actually B2B uh, organizations are looking for a clear statement of purpose about why that company exists. Uh, those that do have that statement of purpose have a really good sense of their own identity and then able to translate that into great customer experience. We discovered that if the company is good at communicating internally, sharing comms and news, uh, being clear about what's happening, they are also much likely, uh, much more likely to deliver great customer service. And then we also saw finally that listening to their employees was tightly correlated to this concept as well. 
So going into this crisis where we're really worried about changing in consumer behaviours, um, why do we think that this is important? Well, if everybody's world has shifted a little bit and we have to get close to customers, then our employees who have daily contacts with them, we need to listen to them. And those that do have a benefit, we need to be really clear about how we are going to change our services. So communication becomes very important. And then connecting consumers to purpose, as we've discussed, is also vital. So these are long-term trends before the crisis, which we think uh, the companies that do best uh, through the crisis might actually be benefiting from. So people who want to stay close to their customer might want to focus on these three dimensions from our research. Um, listening is also really important to reveal uh, what is top of mind for different groups. So one of the questions that we ask is a free text question. You know, when you get home, what do you tell your friends and family about your work? Now. Pre-crisis, the top answer was that your work was a bit stressful. As we can see on the left-hand side there, 15% of people talked about stress, but about 10% of people talked about their rewards. Um, other people uh, talked about having fun at work or the challenge or leadership, but the second highest topic was rewards. Um, and why have I picked that out? Again, this is pre-crisis data, but I think even going into the crisis, we had challenges with many people in organizations feeling that paying rewards was an important topic uh, that lacked some element of fairness in the way that it's been allocated. So if we uh, analyze the language of our surveys, we find that actually uh, roughly about 10% um, uh, of people in total talk about rewards, but those who are under 35 talk about it disproportionately twice as likely to talk about it than someone who's 55 and over. And then if we take that under 35 demographic and then we look at it in a bit more detail through a gender lens, we can see that if you're under 35 and female, you're about twice as likely to talk about it than your male counterpoints. So in an era where we're going to be taking cost-cutting measures, that salaries are going to be under pressure, I think it's more important than ever to remember that even going into the crisis, that fairness around rewards was a big topic. And therefore, as resources are limited and pay uh, is potentially also limited with it, uh, we need to really focus on making sure that any pay awards that we do make are considered to be fair and uh, companies that are successful will be doing that. What have we noticed that's changed during the crisis? Um, well, we asked a different set of questions uh, to about 40 organisations in the last few weeks. Uh, and we spoke about health and safety, whether people felt enabled, um, the future work and personal needs. And what we discovered is that all of those long term trends are still there, but there are some new, very immediate concerns. So only about one in three people feel comfortable traveling to work at the moment. Um, almost four out of 10 people are worried about someone being vulnerable at home. Um, and then also uh, we think that there is a a quite low response here saying that people are able to balance their responsibilities between their home and their work life. Um, so that I think that flexibility around work and being able to meet your responsibilities to uh, your family or the other commitments you have in your life is under stress at the moment, uh, especially with so many people homeschooling. But there's some really positive news. Uh, we've never seen such high scores around collaboration or communication. Um, or even the way of working. So are people able to maintain an effective way of working despite being in different location to where they might normally be, like a home working environment? So some things have really improved. And think, sorry, I just wanted to add there, Pete, there's one of the yeah. things that's really key there is you mentioned the um, 2008 uh, financial crisis. Is one of the things that came out the back of that was that leaders had done an awful lot more about being visible and being uh, communicating out to people. And so they had very high scores. What happened was when the crisis eased a bit and they sort of um, didn't communicate as much, weren't as visible, that's when their scores started to hit. So caution for people is you've increased this communication because we need it. You can't go back to exactly the way you were without actually taking a hit about how people view the communication in the organisation. So it's just a bit of a caution going into uh, as we re-emerge out of this, as we emerge out of this crisis. Sorry, I think I was on mute. So yeah, I think that's spot on. There's a, there is 
uh, one way of viewing the school, which is that it's incredibly encouraging that suddenly we can go from, on average, communication scores are roughly around about 48% pre-crisis. Um, the fact that we've been able to improve it so significantly, so quickly, mm -hmm. shows what's possible with real focus uh, by leaders on one dimension. Uh, but it is a word of caution because, uh, as you say, that, that score had then declined from a previous high in 2008. Mm -hmm. Um, so people notice it when we lose uh, things even more than when we gain them. Um, I'm going to talk just very briefly about um, this point around balancing personal responsibility uh, and uh, some of the challenges that some people feel and why listening in particular is so important. And we spoke about that as being vital to maintaining customer connection, but it's also vital in terms of understanding the experience of employees. So we, uh, again, looked at a lot of data and we used uh, an AI uh, to analyze language. So on the left-hand side, we've got a very typical comment uh, that we see quite often um, that people are asking for expansion of flexible working policy. Uh, and this is something which is being really repeated currently now that people have had a taste for working from home. Why can't we do this in the long run? Now, what's interesting for us is that the people who are talking about that more uh, than others are those who are 35 to 44 who most typically have heightened levels of caring responsibilities. Um, and also uh, because of, I think, long-term societal trends, it's still the case that, at least in the UK, that women are more likely to take those care responsibilities than men. So who talks about flexible working? It's 35 to 44-year-old women in particular, uh, 1.7 times higher. Now, this has been a huge uh, challenge for people, uh, the flexibility to meet caring requirements which have been ramped up and some people feel like they're working harder than ever but there's also those people who are perhaps living by themselves, um, who are single and who've been on furlough and who felt isolated and had more time on their hands than they've ever wanted or needed and have felt that a particular challenge. So I've highlighted one group here, but I think listening to groups, both those who've been in the organisation uh, and feeling perhaps even galvanized by the challenge of meeting the crisis and those who've been put outside the organization with record numbers of people on furlough at the moment uh, highlights the need for listening. So uh, where do we go from here? I mean, we're a research organization. We try to bring to light some data and I hope what we've uh, done is just pick out some of the most important facets around staying connected to customer. What's that mean? Um, and also talking about the importance of listening for different experiences. But um, Julie, I know that you've done a lot of practical work and uh, talked to people about how to take these kind of research-based insights into tangible actions. So, so yeah. I thought maybe you might want to talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things when you're looking at um, making these changes in the organisation is actually you don't have unlimited resources. So one of the great things about getting insights from ClearSight, ClearSight is to know where to focus your resources. So I'm going to pick up a couple of themes that Pete talked about as we go through this. So from an organization development perspective, what does a fit organization have? So there's a number of critical components. And the first one very much aligns to what Pete was talking about, about having purpose, is being aligned to deliver your strategic goals. So are we actually as an organization structured in a way and do we have the right talent to deliver our goals? Um, and that's really key coming out of that because I think a lot of organizations are gonna to have to go back and look at what they're delivering to their customers. Um, and saying, is this the right way to bring our customers back into the market? Is it actually what they need now, seeing as the world has changed? Um, one of the other things that we know about fit organisations is they have real clarity over who is accountable for delivering those goals. And wrapped into that accountability is also things like decision making. So right back when Peter was, talk when Peter was talking about decision making pre-crisis, it was amber. So it wasn't particularly an area where organisations were really clear about who was making that decision or why they were making that decision. Um, and a lot of organizations now about, talk about being agile so they can continually respond to those changing marketplaces. Part of the agility is actually handing decision-making down to the people who it's most appropriate to. So the teams who are doing the work, who are actually inter, um, interfacing with the customers, that's who should be making the decisions. So from an organization development perspective, those are three critical components. Um, and one of the things we've been finding working with clients, especially over the last year, is they're taking three broad approaches to when they're reviewing their organisation and making them fit for purpose in the future. And one is around efficiency. 
I think that's going to be a really key one. Peter already talked about the fact we're going to be going into sort of cost cutting or having, having to have a lower cost base in your organisation. And this efficiency fitness is about looking at how you remove inefficiencies, duplication. Um, how can you centralise more services? How can we provide what we need to to the customer in a more effective way as an organisation? Regional fitness, which is, which is um, quite an interesting perspective because it's how much do you centralise what you do as an organisation and how much do you leave it out in the region so you can respond locally to markets. And when organisations are coming out of um, this kind of crisis and looking to reduce that cost base, quite often they're saying, well, how can we centralise things? Because if you reduce it centrally, then that's going to reduce our cost base. But actually, is that going to deliver what you want to your customer? So that's a real balancing act. Um, and then customer fitness is, are we actually organised to deliver to our customers? There's a lot of organisations we talk about and they say, you know, customer is king or customer is queen and we've really got to deliver to them. And when you look at their organisation, they're actually based around finance or accounting or processes. And what they're not doing is they're not organising themselves to deliver to the customer. They're organising they're organizing themselves around, you know, our financial controls or something. So from an organisation development perspective, those are three broad approaches that we've seen taken by our clients. Now, what do we do next? Well, one of the things, it kind of depends where you're starting from, because a lot of organisations have kind of done the reset. So when the crisis came, they thought about outsourcing and homeworking and realigning what kind of systems support do we need for people. And that's kind of... Um, been reflected in what people are saying about what sort of things have been done successfully you know we know what systems we've needed we've understood how to use them we're actually being allowed to be flexible and working from home well actually you didn't have a lot of choice because government said you had to but that's kind of where organizations have been and as restrictions have been easing and they've been encouraging uh, organizations to go back to work it's about remobilizing and um, from the employee's perspective, you've got things like the change curve. So where am I in this change? How do I feel about it? Am I accepting it? Am I growing it? Do I feel paralyzed by it? Um, survivor syndrome, which is, well, when we go back to work and remobilize, actually there are some of my colleagues who are still out on furlough, um, or some of the colleagues who we know with some of the big organizations have made redundancies. And a lot of organizations don't actually pay attention to how those people who are still within the organization feel about having survived, because not only have they got some guilt about keeping their job, but also they've then lost a lot of their support network in the people who worked around them to help them through this. Um, and one, uh, one factor about remobilization I'm going to spend a bit of time on speaking about is in groups and out groups. So bringing people together back into the organization in a way which means you don't create internal silos which affect their ability to work together. Communication we spoke about earlier, and I gave you that warning about don't step, don't take your foot off the accelerator on communication. Because as Pete says, what you will start to, they'll start to notice it when they don't have it anymore. So that's really key. Um, and then I think one of the things we've been talking to a lot of organizations about is, as Pete said, don't lose, you know, don't use the advantage of a good crisis, is how can you use this to reimagine your organization? How can you actually, um, take a step back before you actually reimagine your organization to see things like where is your customer? How important is your customer to your organization? How agile do you want to be? What kind of cost base do you need to have in your organization? You know, for your financial security, how innovative you can be. And of course, to make it just that little bit harder, all of this needs to be done at the moment with a lot of remote leadership because it's not necessarily that all organizations are going to be able to bring their people back. So when you're looking internally, how do you maintain that social cohesion of your teams? And how do you um, maintain that relationship we have with your customers and your suppliers when you're all working remotely? So it's quite a complex discussion that we're having with a lot of our clients, as you can imagine. So as I said, one of the first things I was going to talk about was in groups and out groups. Um, there are a lot of factors that affect how a group can work together. Um, and one of them is members similarity. There was some research done, I can't remember exactly how long ago, in the 70s by a psychologist called Henri Chafin. And he found it was very, very easy to form groups in groups. And that when you have these groups, they have, they form opinions and have unconscious bias about people in the out group. 
So you're either in the in-group or the out-group. And he showed just how easy it was to do that. Um, and essentially took some boys who were at a summer camp in America and gave one group blue t-shirts and one group red t-shirts. And within about 15 minutes, they were really identifying with whether or not I was a blue t-shirt person or a red blue t-shirt person. So you can see that that is a really easy way to form um, groups. At the moment, I think one of the most pressing ones is going to be furloughed people and non-furloughed people. When you bring those groups back together, what is their opinion going to be about each other? And I've been talking to organisations and they've been talking about how they want to reward the people who've maintained, been working for the organisation through this whole period and not reward those people who've been furloughed. And I've been talking to people on both sides and we've had comments like, well, yeah, they've had 12 weeks holiday sitting around being fully paid. And I've been talking to people who furloughed saying, well, I'm really I'm stressed. I don't know if my job is secure. Why did they choose me to be furloughed? It wasn't my choice. Why is that colleague being given additional money when they've had social interaction, they've had a sense of purpose, and I haven't had that when I've been furloughed. So we're talking to a lot of organisations about how they can bring people back into the office environment, co-located, and actually breaking down a lot of those silos. Um, group size is another thing that helps social cohesion. I think it's um, Jeff Bezos who said, if you can't feed your team on two pizzas, then your team is too big. Having common goals and objectives really helps a team. And going forward, that reinforcement of the purpose of the organization is going to be really key. So what are we doing for our customers? What is our purpose? And talking about that. Um, and then one of the other things that helps groups is um, group success. So one of the really key things going, coming out of this is going to be talking about how successful we've been to re-engage our customers or our partners. And again, using that in the way to continue that communication that leaders have been doing over the last few weeks. And one of the other things that just helps is that external competition. So, you know, there's going to be a lot of people going back into the marketplace and that competition for customers is going to increase. So the organisations can use that to really form their teams and get them going in the right direction. So in groups and out groups, there are some positives about this whole fact that we can form in groups really quickly. Uh, and one of them is that we can bond very quickly. And as I said, TFAL found that you can do that in 15 minutes. Obviously with work, it's a little more complex, but teams bond in together really quickly so they can work effectively together. They get their own shorthand. They understand how one uh, works together. They understand their role. The downsides of that is when we form in groups is we develop unconscious biases about other people. So we make assumptions about what the other group and how they work. And it's been shown also in work, actually, um, people have assumptions about the level of capability. And surprisingly, um, people in the out group aren't as capable as the people in the in group. So you can see there's some real drawbacks to allowing these um, unconscious biases to develop about the out group. Um, and one of the other things, of, of course, is that it makes it ineffective if you've got an out group or a group you consider not to be as capable as you are. That's going to affect how you can work across those boundaries. Uh, and through the crisis, I've had lots of people talking about how effectively teams are talking. We're on Zoom every week or we're on Teams every week and we're talking to each other all the time. What I haven't heard as much of is how those teams are talking to other teams. So how porous has that team been through the crisis? Are you actually talking to the adjacent teams? Are you actually having, you know, where are those random conversations that we have at the water cooler or in the corridor that spark ideas or make connections between teams because that is being lost in this remote working. So how can you start to address these issues? Well, going back to Pete's point earlier, listening is really important and it's going to be incredibly important when you bring those groups. So either groups that have been working from home who are now being brought back into um, co-location or furloughed people there's going to be a lot of things there that people really need to talk about and providing a safe environment for them to talk about their lockdown experience positive and negative is going to be a really key thing going because it can't be the elephant in the room we're going to have to address it I think one of the other key things is actually dealing with that unconscious bias and bringing it onto the table and actually saying well what do we think about the people who've been furloughed or the people in those teams and just making sure that what we're doing is not allowing those unconscious biases to affect how effective we can be as a team. Okay, so one of the other things I was going to talk about, well, the other two things I was going to talk about was really low cost base and being customer focused. Um, 
and taking the opportunity to reimagine your organization, you are going to need to understand what your customers want um, and how to deliver that. And we would start from what we call the value chain perspective. So if we know exactly what our purpose is and we know what our customers want from us, we can think about what are the absolute key activities that we need to do to deliver that. So just in this example, we've got marketing through to supplier management. Now these are very generic and obviously with every organization, it's slightly different depending on what you're doing and who your customer base is. So we work uh, with organizations at the beginning to actually say, well, what is our value chain? What are the things we have to do really well to deliver to our customer? And then uh, on the next sheet you'll see, but before I go into the next one, there are an awful lot of steps between this one and the next slide, but I'm not gonna take you through them, otherwise we'll be here for a while. But we would do things like, well, what are the design principles that we want for this organization? What are gonna be the key things that as we design our organizational options going forward, that as we reimagine our organization, what are our hard and fast rules that we want to maintain? So, you know, one thing would be being customer focused. Another one might be that you have a set of values or principles that are very key. Being agile is really important. So we take all of those things into account. Uh, and what we do is we start by looking at what you do now. So how do you currently de develop, um, deliver your value chain? So that gives us ideas about where you're duplicating or gives us options for how we might redesign the organization to make it more effective. And then lots and lots of steps later, we get the next slide. And it might look like that. Now it might not, but it might look like that. And what we have here is we still have the same value chain, but what there's a recognition is that obviously there are corporate services to be delivered by HR, finance and IT. But what we're looking at here is what we might say is, well, for some particular parts of our market, there are elements that we need to deliver differently because there are three different markets, but there might be bits that we can actually centralize. So we can take the duplication out. We can reduce that cost base. So we might be able to deliver fulfillment across three different markets or supplier management might actually be able to be done centrally across those three markets. But actually for market D, which has specific requirements or specific products, actually it needs to be virtually integrated and it needs to do everything itself. But what you've done is you've stepped back and said, what's our value chain? What do our customers need? Therefore, what's the most effective way to deliver it? When you do these kind of reorganizations or reimagining your organization, there's definitely shifting of power. Um, and that's one of the key things that as psychologists we're really aware of is that if we change the way the organization is structured, we're going to change power bases. So people, there are going to be winners and losers. And so when we're working with organizations, we're highlighting to this and we're working with these organizations to make sure that shifting power doesn't actually negatively, negatively impact on what the organization is doing. If you're looking at things like um, providing fulfillment across all three markets, you need to have operational excellence. You need functional excellence. So what are the processes within fulfillment? Are they as effective as it can be? Do we have the right people? Do we have the right capabilities? Um, and then one of the key things is always going to be around the decision making, and that's related to the power. So where is the decision making? Is it in the right place? Do we actually have customer front and center? Have we empowered people? Um, and then also it's all of those effective interfaces between the teams and the organization. So all of this can be reimagined so that you can deliver your purpose in a more effective way, which helps you be more customer focused, which we know is going to be key going forward, but also from a lower cost base. A couple of things that underpin that is you may well have new capabilities. So um, it may be about we have got a certain number of skills in the organization, but we either need to up train people or we need to bring new people in to bring those capabilities. And one of the other things we know about reimagining re organizations is potentially you have this real change in behavior. So the way that we work needs to be different. Um, and that can also take a lot of time because as humans, we have habits and we just behave the way we do. We have a culture and that's the way we've always done things. So when you go in and say, actually, we need to do things differently, you need to work with people to reinforce that new behavior so that that becomes the new habit rather than you always fall back onto the old habit. So you can see from the last slide to this slide, there's an awful lot of steps, but we've been working with a lot of organizations and what the crisis has done is actually given a lot of organizations a burning platform to say, we do need to reimagine the way we deliver to our customers. Um, and we're working with a lot of organizations on that. Awesome.
Brilliant. Well, I mean, thanks to you. I thought that was incredibly thought-provoking in terms of uh, taking challenges that we identify in the trends that we look at and then actually putting it into an actionable framework, uh, especially around organization structure. When we are going to have to reimagine and rethink so much what we do is, is, is really quite powerful. Um, Ope, I know that you were uh, hoping that this session is a, a conversation as much as it is a presentation. So if I... Uh, if I was Thanks, Pete. Sorry. I think there are a few questions here from different people just in terms of the conversations you've had. I'll give Julia a little bit of a break. So I'll start with the questions directly at you. So you find Pete first, then I'll be back. <laughs> Um, so, Pete, when you started the conversation, you started around, um, you know, examples of organisations that have survived crisis. So Amazon, Netflix, um, Nike as well. Um, someone here is asking, in terms of successful leadership, what do you think they are doing differently right now that is making them successful? And I know it might be different for different organisations. What would you say are the top three maybe things they're doing um, are? Yeah, I, I think... There's, um, there's examples of leaders getting this right and wrong in uh, some of the very public examples that we have at the moment. So uh, there was a pretty uh, difficult moment, I think, for EasyJet recently where 99% uh, of the pilots completed a poll where they said they'd lost confidence in the CEO. Now, obviously, that's pretty devastating. It's a particularly challenged business because of the, uh, the changes. Um, that, that lockdown's forced upon it. I mean, it's, it's effectively ceased operations. Um, and we understand that. But I think what marks that experience out from other similarly challenged organisations which had a much more positive response is we have seen this incredible increase in communication. I think leaders have to be totally transparent about how they view the crisis and its impacts. It's simply not possible to ignore uh, the conversations that your people want to have. So I would say, firstly, communication is absolutely vital. Secondly, um, I think it's okay for some leaders to say uh, that they know some things and they don't know others. So to be transparent in that communication around what they're certain about in their plans and what they still think that they need to uh, develop. Um, and then the third thing, which I think uh, we've directly observed in a lot of our um, a lot of our analysis is just to share some kind of personal uh, impact. So people really want to understand some kind of uh, authentic message, which also means that you have to be uh, clear about how this relates to your experience of the crisis itself. So a much more personal approach. Um, and I think those things really stand out. It's like communicate often, be transparent about what you are going to do, but also what you don't know yet. And uh, don't be afraid to use this as an opportunity to make some kind of personal connection and make some form of authentic leadership. And that can be also about setting an example. So definitely don't ask your people to do anything you're not prepared to do yourself and to share that um, uh, as often as you can. I don't know if, uh, Judy, you've got some experience in some of the work you've done, which may highlight other factors. Um, I think one of the key things is authenticity. I mean, you, you talked about EasyJet have lost confidence in the CEO. If you take another example, this is Primark, where actually confidence in the CEO has been has shot up because the communication was incredibly authentic. Um, and also they've just made, recently taken the decision not to take the um, returning furlough bonus from the government, which just shows a level of integrity that has been communicated out extremely well. Um, to them, and I, I just I think reinforcing your points about don't pretend that you know what you don't know, um, mm. but actually just if you don't know, but you know you, you think you might know it in two months, and actually say that, say actually we, we're working through this. It'll take us a couple of months, and we will come back and communicate to you when we do that. But I think behaviourally, it is about if you say you're going to do something, then you do it. So if you say you're going to come back and communicate in two months' time, you come back and communicate in two months' time. If you say um, we will give you the answers this next week. You do it. You reinforce what you've said with your behaviour. And that's what builds up that integrity and trust in leadership. Um, and that's what shows you as being an authentic leader. Thanks for that, Pete and Julie. I think that's really, really insightful. Um, another point that keeps coming up is the in-groups and out-groups, which <laughs> I think is also really fascinating. So yeah. 
questions here is about what can we learn from in groups and out groups about how to break down barriers when it comes to inclusion and belonging right. so that's yeah. very different now because we're working virtually how yeah. would you respond to that julie should i start with you yeah um in groups and out groups well one of the ways of breaking down in groups and out groups is increasing your understanding of the other group um so that's really key um, if you look at any kind of buddy movie that starts off where you've got two protagonists who come from different areas and they, they don't like each other and what you see through the film is they come together by understanding each other and getting a better perspective about being in the other person's shoes and understanding where they've come from. So I think there are a lot of lessons to learn about actually being honest about the fact that all of us have unconscious bias. It's natural because the brain can't process the amount of information it gets every day. So we do take all these shortcuts. So I think recognizing it and often unconscious bias is used as a pejorative term. You know, it's a bad thing, but it's, it just is the way that we can cope with the world. But it is about looking at those unconscious bias, accepting that they exist, acknowledging them because that actually reduces their impact. And then looking at the processes and the way that our organization works to see what reinforces it and starting to re reduce on, reduce those things. Um, and then giving, groups opportunities to have that cross conversation so they start to get to know each other which is more difficult because we are remote but it's not impossible because you can actually mix up those groups we're talking to an organization at the moment who are bringing a third of their call center people back um, and so they have a third of them working on week one then they clean out the office and then the second group come in clean out the office blah 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 so we've been doing things like discouraging them from even labeling those groups because you start to label you start to identify with that label um, and then absolutely one of the things we've been saying to them is don't keep those groups exactly as they are all the way through mix them up make sure that you've got um, projects that go across the different groups so that it's not just you know week one group that works on that project you've actually got people across those projects so you keep breaking down those barriers and in terms of things like inclusion and belonging i think a lot of those principles apply as well it's about understanding what unconscious bias we have how does our organization reinforce it and making sure that people have got opportunities to work across those boundaries so that that reduces it I think I agree with all of that. <laughs> um, I've, I've um, just add a few other points around uh, in and out groups in the context of furlough. It's just, I think it's really important that everybody has a positive message around those people who have been asked to take furlough, that it is a, in many ways a sacrifice for the benefit of all, um, and that it is a, a route for companies to survive this crisis. So I, I think it's important that a message of, um, you know, being grateful to people who've done that. And it is hard. It's hard to take yourself out of a situation uh, and to be actively uh, stood down. So firstly, I, you know, on that point, on the general point around um, inclusion, I think absolutely everything you've just said and uh, just also to raise awareness of some of the fundamental facts because I think where the, the debate can sometimes get a bit lost is where we don't truly understand that there are uh, differing experiences that we will have because of facets of our identity in organisations and to just make sure that that's clear and that we don't think that that's necessarily acceptable. Um, sorry, no, we just don't think it's acceptable. So we, we do a lot of work about raising uh, awareness in organisations of disparate outcomes that people uh, receive because, for example, um, we can say that if you are a, uh, a person who is disabled and who identifies as a woman, you are more than 60% likely to have felt in some way uh, uncomfortable or experienced some unacceptable behaviour towards you in a workplace. And that is six times the rates than if you are just uh, a woman or if you are just uh, disabled. So that intersectional identity is really important. And I think raising up the, the awareness of those experiences is vital to us then accepting that we need to do something about that and to address inclusion as a priority. 
Thank you very much, Julie and Pete. Um, there are other questions and just for the people listening in, if you have any more questions, please feel free to type them up and I'll read them. Um, there's another one here about how do we balance the costs of people initiatives versus the benefits? If we're really cost cutting and focusing on bottom line, especially in a crisis, this kind of feels like a luxury. Um, do you want to go first, I Pete? Yeah, happily. Uh, I, I feel really strongly that actually we are increasingly at a point where we do have data where we can show people initiatives delivers tangible financial benefit. So the, um, the 16 dimensions that we were talking about, we've got excellent evidence to show that uh, the companies that have invested in their organisations, uh, especially around certain key areas, will outperform in terms of revenue growth. Um, they will also outperform in terms of their ability to uh, be profitable uh, and deliver better customer service, which was a dimension we focused on today um, because we think customer service is going to be particularly important in a, in a crisis moment where customer needs are changing quite quickly. Um, now, the level of investment and the impacts is uh, a calculation which is probably one that has to be done at a company level. But I think there are really clear business cases and evidence to show that some investment in organizations at the right time can be absolutely vital. And so if you are considering um, cost cutting measures, I think you also need to think a little bit about the impacts on the organization's ability to remain fit um, and to deliver on its purpose in this moment of crisis and that that will have some impact. So. We know that uh, if uh, one of our dimensions, innovation, is sacrifice, then in the long run, revenue growth will no longer be possible. If we don't change our service, we become irrelevant or our products. Uh, everybody knows that intuitively. We've got great evidence for that. Does that mean that that cost cut is going to have an impact tomorrow? Potentially not, uh, but the day after tomorrow, certainly. Um, so we think actually there's really good empirical data and that's one of the things that ClearSight works very hard on is showing that tight link between investment in organizations and bottom line financial results. Um, and that actually it's very possible to quantify the return on that investment now um, using some really good analytics. I mean, we certainly use those when we're talking to organisations about things like where you can reduce inefficiencies or you can reduce duplications because one of the key things about this is if you, if you do have to look at uh, delivering on a lower cost base, you've still got to deliver on a lower cost base that's going to mean you can survive and grow in the future. So it can't just be a, a sort of brutal just sort of cut. It has to be an informed um, reduction in that cost base and also as Pete said some, sometimes it's about taking cost out someone else but somewhere else but actually then reinvesting it so if we're talking about the way we reimagine the organization we need some new capabilities it may be that actually some of that saving has to be reinvested to develop the people to take you forward so I think the analytics actually helps you make better informed decisions about where you make the cost where you lower your cost base, how you lower it, but also what you need to maintain for going forward. Thank you. Pete, were you about to say something? I was, I, I was just going to say that I, uh, I, I think what she's saying is really important. It's just the, the bigger question is where do you take the cost out as well? And I think just having that lined up to the change in circumstance uh, is, is a key way to to work that through so nobody should cut costs for the sake of it they cut costs because maybe the market isn't there or because customer demand isn't there or because the overall volume in the business is uh, has been adjusted so i think you know in these moments it's important to set realistic uh, targets for how much cost you're withdrawing but know why you're doing it um it is not the case uh, that you just cut costs because you think it's a good idea. You you cut it because there's a change in circumstances. And equally, you invest based on the return that you think you should get from that. Absolutely, Pete. Um, thank you very much for that, Pete and Julie. So we have one final question. And Pete, this might be, I believe, directed exactly towards you. Um, is attrition an outcome variable you measure as well? Yeah, um, it's something that um, ClearSight's helps lots of companies understand 
uh, the drivers of attrition in their organizations and, and try and optimize that. And I think um, there are things which uh, you can do to help in make an improvement there. And if you're talking about a cost saving, uh, the cost of losing someone from an organization is anywhere between 30 and 60% of their, uh, their gross salary, um, depending on what they do and um, onboarding costs and so on and so forth and recruitment costs. Um, but that's absolutely an outcome that you can measure and optimize. Uh, and just to give you a, a simple example of that, one of the things that we looked at was measuring uh, attrition and absence, uh, the number of days people take off sick, correlating that to your appetite to do overtime and how much holiday you take. Um, so uh, we've got some pretty good evidence that you can use small nudges to employees about making sure they have a good work-life balance to prevent them from overworking to the point where they burn out and leave the organization or take prolonged sick periods. So for us actually doing the right thing um, and helping people uh, can also be the smart thing when it comes to getting a good financial benefit. That's a very long-winded way of saying, yes, we do measure attrition and we help organisations manage against it. Yeah, one of the things I would just add in, in, in where we are at the moment, there are obviously going to be there are a lot of job losses and, and that. And I talked briefly about survivor, um, survivor syndrome, or, you know, the guilt that people have. One of the really um, cautious things about this is not losing the people you need to get the organisation going forward. So you mm -hmm. Essentially, the, the psychological contract is broken, has been broken or changed radically by what's been happening. Um, and organisations need to understand how it's been changed and how to get that back. Otherwise, the people, once things begin to calm down, I mean, I've, I've known people who have actually changed jobs during this lockdown. So they've actually found new employers. So there is jobs out there. It's you, as an organisation, you need to be sure that you're not losing the people that you need to keep to keep you as fit organisation who can go in the future. So there's also things around taking those metrics that Pete's been talking about and actually I'm thinking about what does that mean for the way that we work as an organisation or the way that we're organised or how we reward and recognise people so we can actually overcome that survivor guilt so that we don't get attrition of the people that we want to keep as we go forward. Absolutely spot on, Julie. Um, so that was the last question we have. And I just want you this opportunity to say a massive thank you to Julie and Pete. Um, there were a lot of nuggets there, in incredible insights there. I think for me, the main things were communication, not stopping something good that you've started. So don't stop communicating. I think the last one was the ins and outs groups and, and being conscious of that because I think also that was a new thing for me to learn today. Um, so I just want to say a massive thank you to you both. Um, and to everyone that's on the call, we have recorded this session. So on the back end of it, we will be sharing the presentation and the recording to you. So feel free to share that with people that you think um, would find this really useful. Um, Pete and Julie, anything you'd like to add before we say bye to everyone? No, just uh, thanks so much for joining and uh, thanks for hosting us, Ope. Yeah, thanks very much. And thanks to the questions. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and hopefully we'll see you in our next Clearshare webinar.